Welcome to the third lecture in igneous and metamorphic petrology. Today's lecture will focus on chemical petrology and the major elements and how we use the major elements to define different magma series in the Earth's surface, crust, and in the mantle. We can use a lot of the same principles to classify metamorphic rocks later in the semester, but today we're going to be focusing on igneous rocks and melts. When we define major elements, we're defining a ma major element as any element that is usually greater than 1% of the total volume of the rock. These elements are going to include silica, aluminum, iron, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, and water. We also have to define minor elements, which are going to be between 0.1 and 1% of the rock. These are going to include titanium, manganese, phosphate, and carbon dioxide. In the next few lectures, we'll discuss minor elements more as well as the trace elements. When we define a trace element, we're going to be defining a trace element as anything between 0.1 and 0% of the total volume of the rock. And that's going to include everything else in the periodic table. Major and minor elements are usually going to be expressed as weight percent oxides, or grams of oxide per 100 grams of sample. A trace element will be expressed as parts per million concentration, which means that we have, when we're dealing with trace elements, we're going to look at how many atoms are present out of 1 million atoms in the total system. The relationship between weight percent oxide is roughly 10,000 parts per million for one weight percent oxide. In our major elements, we have one element that's going to be a special element that we have to take into consideration while we're dealing with, with classification. Iron is the only major element that occurs widely as two different valence states, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. The ratio of iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus increases with oxygen fugacity in the rock or melt. When we refer to oxygen fugacity, oxygen fugacity will be a relationship between the real gas pressure or fluid equivalent pressure and the oxygen fugacity coefficient. We'll talk about this more later in the semester, but right now what's important to understand is that the ratio of iron 3 plus to 2 plus will be dictated by the oxidation state of the, the magmatic system. And the ratio of iron 3 plus to 2 plus is important because iron 3 plus is concentrating in iron titanium oxide minerals such as magnetite and ilmenite, and therefore different mineral phases can be present as a result. Normally, when we're going to report iron, and, and as we'll do through most of this lecture, we'll report iron as FeO star or FeOT for total, which is a mathematical relationship between iron 3 plus and iron 2 plus. The primary method of describing geochemical data in igneous and metamorphic rocks are, are going to be by bivariate diagrams or XY diagrams. The more general term for these diagrams are going to be Harker diagrams for igneous rocks. Bivariate plots use a simple diagram to plot weight percents of two elements against one another for comparison. The most common element for the x-axis will be silica, followed by magnesium. A key feature of these diagrams is the ability to identify primary magmas from differentiated magmas and describe different trends of magmatic systems. We model these with three different assumptions. One, rocks are related by chemical process, mostly in the case of the pink lines that are on the diagrams and on the right will be fractional crystallization. Two, trends are going to equal liquid lines of descent. We can interpret what minerals will be fractionating as a result of the, the trend lines that are being presented in, in the diagrams. And three, basalt will be our parent magma from which all other magmas are derived. When we refer to these types of diagrams and we refer to a parental magma, most of our parental magmas will be what we're going to refer to as a primary magma. These are magmas derived directly from a partial melting of a source, and they have no characteristics that reflect the effects of subsequent differentiation. Sources of these magmas are assumed to be the mantle, but they can also be present in other locations on, in the Earth's crust. A differentiated magma, or an evolved magma, are those that have experienced some amount of differentiation or are modified after being produced. A secondary way of describing geochemical data, mainly in the major elements, is going to be the ternary variation diagram. The example diagram we have shown here is was referred to as the AFM diagram, standing for alkalis, iron, and magnesium diagram. Like the Harker diagrams, it's going to allow us to model uh, different elements in relation to one another and we'll be able to pull out trends related to each element, trends 
that are going to equal liquid lines of descent, minerals that are crystallizing, and that basalt will be the parent magma from which others are derived. The AFM diagram is going to be our primary way of describing these trends. When we discuss the AFM diagram, alkalis are going to include sodium and potassium, iron will be iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus, and magnesium for each end member of the corners. The diagram allows us to, to compare four different major elements without having to discard any other any major uh, information. When we define a magma series, it's, it's easy to think of them as something like a, a, a biological system where we have families, kingdoms, genus, and species. So our question is, is what do we need to use to describe different types of magma series? And can we use chemistry to describe these series? Early on, it was recognized that chemical parameters were very useful in regarding to distinguish, distinguish different mineral mineralogical and magmatic groups. The three primary methods are going to be used, we're going to use here are going to be total alkalis, silica and silica saturation, and aluminum. The total alkalis versus silica diagram, or where we use sodium plus potassium versus silica, will allow us to, to define our largest subgrouping of, of igneous rocks, alkaline versus subalkaline rocks. What we have here in this diagram is a total alkalized versus silica diagram for alkaline rocks in red and subalkaline rocks in blue for rocks erupted in Hawaii volcanoes. The influence of silica and alkali content are reflected in the names of the two different major series. Alkaline rocks are richer in the alkali contents and commonly silica undersaturated, meaning that they have less silica and higher total alkali contents. Whereas when we get to subalkaline rocks, silica will be saturated to oversaturated, meaning we have less sodium and potassium for a lower silica concentration or a higher silica concentration that reflects a different overall slope of the two elements in relation to one another. Our second way of describing magmatic series is using the basalt tetrahedron and the nepheline olivine quartz base. Alkaline and subalkaline fields are very distinct in, this, in these two tetrahedrons and ternary diagrams. The nepheline diopside forced right quartz tetrahedron, called the basalt tetrahedron, is useful because it's, it describes the basalts that are silica undersaturated, silica saturated, and silica oversaturated. The diopside albite ensotype plane is called the plane of silica saturation because to the right of it, a silica polymorph is stable, indicating silica oversaturation. Whereas to the left of the silica undersaturated phase, olivine is stable without a silica polymorph. If you remember, we talked about this a little bit last semester when we were talking about ternary phase diagrams, and you guys have seen this diagram before. And we, when we discussed this, we, we described that that plane of silica saturation or the diopside ensotite forced right triangle will dictate what mineral phases will be present in the beginning and end, depending on where the original composition of the liquid is starting or ending. Alkaline rocks, which plot to the left of the diagram, and are diopside, nepheline, olivine, albite, normative, are considered to be undersaturated. What we mean by normative is that they are normalized into those of the rocks that are being used to describe the name of the rock. Subalkaline rocks on the right of the diagram are diopside, albite, ensotite, quartz normative, meaning that olivine and nepheline will never coexist. If you remember from last semester when we were looking at this diagram, if we started out with a composition that was in the albite, olivine, quartz field, to the right of the ensotite line, the rocks started to, to crystallize out whatever mineral was closest in the, for the end member, went to the, the uh, peritectic and finalized at the, uh, the eutectic point. Whereas if we were on the forced right ensotite diopside side of the, di of the line, the first mineral to crystallize out sent the, the composition of the liquid towards the peritectic, where 
the peritectic ended as the eutectic point in the final liquid composition. Another crucial factor of, of the basalt tetrahedron is the thermal divide that separates the silica saturation or the subalkaline rocks from silica undersaturated alkaline fields at low pressures. When we talked about this last semester, we, we were talking about that these rocks on either side cannot cross this divide by fractional crystallization or crystallizing out just a single phase or two phases. So can't deprive one series from can't derive this one series from another at least at very low pressures. The two series should be distinct, and at low pressures, because of this thermal divide along the albite olivine trend, it prevents liquids from crossing as they cool. Subalkaline rocks can be can be olivine bearing or quartz bearing, depending upon which side of the plane of silica saturation they occupy. As a result, the subalkaline series was further divided into the tholeite and calc alkaline series. The AFM diagram can allows us to see this further subdivision of alkaline mag magmas into tholeites and calc alkaline series. Although these two subdivisions cannot be distinguished in either the alkali silica or nepheline olivine quartz diagrams, they do plot as distinct fields in the AFM diagram. And again, when we start talking about aluminum here momentarily, it'll, it'll have a distinct plot especially when we compare these to cation normative plagioclase. The relationship between more derived rocks becomes even more apparent as on the AFM diagram as, as the rocks evolve. If we compare figure 8.3 with 8.14, we can see that rocks from the Skagard intrusion, the curved trend with the pinkish red dots are similar to the tholeitic trend on, eight, on figure 8.14. The rocks from Crater Lake in the black trend is very much very similar to the, the calc alkaline trend. Both series progress along the basalt and dacite rhyolite trend, but there are distinctive mineralogical and chemical differences between the two series that are more evident for intermediate compositions. Researchers have found it impossible to consistently distinguish more silicic end members in the two series because they converge after different iron enrichment paths that characterize intermediate stages. Our final way of classifying magma series in, in igneous melts is using aluminum saturation. This is a classification that's based on the molar proportions of aluminum versus calcium, sodium, plus potassium, or A over C and K. Common non-quartz feldspathic minerals for each type are included. Essentially is what this plot shows us is it shows us the relationship between aluminum and alkali elements. So if you look at the two alkali elements we were previously discussed, sodium and potassium, they show a general trend of increasing with increasing silica concentration. In contrast to that, our third alkali element, calcium, shows a decrease in concentration as silica increases. So we can use this relationship to, to plot the relationship between these two different elements, or different series of elements, and compare that to aluminum. As a result, in the aluminum saturation classification, we end up with three classifications that are distinct from tholeites, calcalkaline rocks, and alkaline rocks. We end up with perluminous, metaluminous, and peralkaline rocks. A perluminous rock is going to be a rock or magma that's going to contain more aluminum than the combination of sodium, potassium, and calcium, and typically will con contain minerals such as biotite, muscovite, cordite, andalusite, or garnet. Metaluminous rocks are going to be rocks or magmas that are going to contain more aluminum than potassium and sodium, but less aluminum than potassium plus sodium plus calcium. Common mineral phases that are going to be in, in these rocks will be pyroxenes, hornblendes, and biotites. You'll notice that it's difficult to distinguish just in the presence of biotite between a perluminous and metaluminous rock. It requires a different a second phase that will be unique to either of those two different uh, classifications. Our final classification is peralkaline rocks or magmas. These are going to be rocks or magmas that are going to contain less aluminum 
than sodium and potassium combined. These are going to form with, with unique minerals such as adrenine, rebekite, and other amphiboles that are going to be unique to a system that's depleted in aluminum content. After we combine these different classification series, it's, it's easy to identify the types of magmas that are going to be produced at different types of environments. The plot here shows 41,000 igneous rock analyses that were combined by Lemaitre in 1976. Subdivisions break down more analyses with no obvious break between subalkaline and alkaline rocks. When we look at this diagram, there's a distinct correlation that should be observed here. First, calc alkaline rocks, which are going to be in the kind of pinkish colors, are restricted to subduction zones and only cross over the calc alkaline alkaline line when they are uh, at low silica contents. Foliate magmas are pr practically exclusive to mid-ocean ridges. Some alkaline magmas are going to be found but found at mid-ocean ridges, but they're going to be subordinate to the tholeite composition magmas. We will continue to explore the relationships of alkaline and subalkaline magmas later in the semester when we start talking about different environments of magma generation. Our next lecture, though, will focus on trace elements and isotopic analyses of igneous rocks to further classify them and allow us to, to use these different elements to see how magmas evolve and differentiate more effectively.